Good afternoon. My name is Art Worshipful Moses Gomez, past Grand Historian of the Grand Lodge of New Jersey. And I'm here today at the Grand Lodge Temple in Philadelphia to present my lecture, Freemasonry in Cuba. Uh, this has a special uh, love in my heart because my parents were from Cuba. So it's very interesting that I get to speak a little bit about masonry in my parents' home country. Now, Cuba, of course, we know was discovered, or not discovered because there were people there, but it was discovered by the Europeans on Christopher Columbus' first visit in 1492. But it wasn't actually settled or settled as there until 1511 when Diego Velasquez actually settled there and created a settlement on behalf of the Spanish government or the King of Spain. And if you look to the left, these are two, one of the earliest known maps of Cuba. And it's also one of the earliest maps of Cuba with the actual Cuban flag on it. Now, Cuba is very interesting. It has a long tradition of being uh, occupied or being controlled by other nations, uh, mostly the Spain, but the British also had it for a short time. And the first known or earliest Masonic activities in the island came in 1762 when the English conquered Cuba from Spain for about eight months. And during that time, there was an Irish regimental lodge uh, registered as lodge number 218, and they were actually brought the warrant with them to Cuba and operated there. They were not allowed to make masons. However, they did meet as a regimental lodge and actually uh, had meetings there. Now, they were only there for about eight months at the most. Uh, then it, English ceded Cuba back to Spain again. And then Spain had it for the next several, uh, about 200 years later. Now, during the French uh, Haitian wars and the independence for Haiti, the revolution, many of the lodges left Haiti and traveled across the western shores to Cuba and landed on the eastern shores of Cuba. And there they actually chartered and operated three lodges uh, that were operated under French or Haitian lodges at the time. So masonry in Cuba at least dates back to 1762. And if you look there in front of you on the screen, you'll see the actual charter of the lodge number 218, which is under an Irish constitution lodge. And also to the right is the earliest known names of members that pertain to that lodge, especially those during the time of Cuba, when they were in Cuba. Now, interestingly enough, the first chartered lodge, and this is very unique because not only am I speaking in the Grand Lodge Masonic Temple here in Philadelphia, but the first Masonic lodge or chartered in Cuba was by the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania in 1804. And it was called the Temple of the Theological Virtues. Uh, and again, it was chartered by this great jurisdiction here. Uh, and it was chartered to a brother named Joseph Cernu, who many may not may know. He was a Scottish Rite Mason and caused a lot of schisms and issues with the Scottish Rite here in the Americas. And again, this is the actual warrant, which is still in fantastic shape. It is housed in the Grand Lodge of Cuba Museum and Library as well. They have a really beautiful library and museum there and is on display there. Uh, of course, you can't touch it, but it is in very good shape. Now, the second pattern you see here, which is not in good shape, uh, quite beat up and quite uh, very frail and fragile, is the charter, one of the original charters that was issued to the Grand Lodge of Cologne. Now, because Cuba was under Spanish dominion, very Catholic country, uh, as you know, Catholics aren't supposed to be Masons. Uh, don't tell anybody, but I am one. Now, the other side part was that they tried to hide the fact that they didn't want it named the, the Grand Lodge of Cuba. So they named that the Cologne, honoring Christopher Columbus, hoping that the Spanish would kind of just ignore it or uh, get fooled by it. Uh, however, the charter originally came to be in December 5th, 1859, which the charter was actually come to fruition. And this was done by the Grand Lodge of South Carolina. So Pennsylvania chartered the first lodge, but the actual charter of the Grand Lodge of Cuba was given by the Grand Lodge of South Carolina. Uh, and that was done in 1859. And they went on to create three other lodges right off the bat. Fraternidad number one, Prudencia number two, y San Andres number three. Now, the interesting part about my lecture is how masonry had a particular hand in the revolutions, especially during the 1800s in Cuba. You know, here in America itself, we tend to think that the American Revolution was a Masonic 
uh, revolution, but it wasn't. It was just a revolution that had many Masons in, involved or played a part in it. But in Cuba, we see Masonry actually taking part in conspiracies and trying to bolster revolution and independence from Spain. And the great one was the Great Masonic Conspiracy of 1810. Members of that first lodge that was chartered by the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, many of those members, including this brother here, Joaquin Infante, came together to create a lodge and to be able to use this lodge to discuss how they can actually have a revolution, freeing themselves from oppression from Spain, but also taking it a step further, not just freeing themselves from a, from a monarchical rule, but also ending slavery in Cuba. Now, one of those individuals was Jose Antonio Aponte. He was a uh, mulatto Negro from Cuba of mixed race. And part of the 1810 conspiracy and uprising in Havana, he was one of those individuals that was actually leading the uprising after having their meetings in secrecy. And some of these individuals were actually caught. And on April 9th, 1812, these individuals were put to death in the gallows without any trial or any type of jurisdiction or jurisprudence. They just decided that they were going to capture them, throw them in, in the gallows, and then they were actually killed. Uh, to prove and go a little bit step further, Jose Antonio Amponte actually was beheaded and his head was hung in an iron cage on the corner of the intersection of De La Corsin y Carlos III. The interesting thing part is that the Grand Lodge building of Cuba is now built on the same corner where Jose Antonio Amponte was executed and beheaded and where his head actually hung. Now, many Cuban Freemasons had a big interest in freeing their nation from Spain. And what makes the presence of masonry in Cuba uniquely responded to the role it played during the three decades of struggle for independence from Spanish rule between 1868 and 1895, which there were three main revolutions that were tried to put place, the last one actually succeeding. Now, these gentlemen here, Jose Francisco Limos and Jose Maria Herrera, they were actually Brother Masons who came from that original uh, conspiracy and later on decided they were going to create a organization uh, that was actually named Los Soles, the Boulevard after Simon Bolivar, the great Mason and liberator of South America. And Lemus begins to conspire in Cuba in 1822, using meetings of the Masonic Lodge, Los Solis, created by him with the touches, signs, rituals, hierarchies of Freemasonry. Each affiliate soul, which was a member, before becoming a lightning, a full member, had to recruit no less than seven new fellows with whom they maintained their links. The conspiracy Reyes y Soles de Boulevard was one of the premature attempts to achieve Cuban independence. Each member had to recruit another member whom they were granted the degree of son and those who had sworn formed their Rey, which is a lodge. It adopted this flag that you see here with a turquoise blue center and at its midpoint, a bright silver sun with a crimson circumference, uh, circumference or a bright golden sun, as you see here in the picture. What is indisputable fact, and which many have more to do with this tolerance, is that the very independence of Cuba was achieved by the assistance of Cuban Freemasons. Now, the next individual played a really unique role in the first major in the attempt at revolution during the 1850s. And his name was Narciso Lopez. He was not of Cuban birth. He was actually born in Caracas, Venezuela, but immigrated to Havana and there actually became a general. And he is best known for expeditions aimed at liberating Cuba from Spanish rule in the 1850s. Now, Narciso Lopez is very unique because he actually came to America and became not only a Mason here in America, but also tried to seek out Masons in position of power throughout the South in the United States. Uh, he spent time in Louisiana uh, with, with the uh, governor who was at that time a brother Mason named Quitman. He actually uh, made it to Texas with, and met some of the early founders of the Grand Lodge of Texas, Holland One and some of the uh, individuals who, uh, after the Civil War themselves, created the Grand Lodge of Texas by creating the first, the first lodge there as well. He tried to befriend them as well. 
and he was seeking assistance, money, aid, and manpower. Uh, but the interesting thing was that he actually went to the Grand Lodge of Georgia. And the oldest Grand Lodge of Georgia is Savannah Lodge number one. And in 1850, according to the minutes we see here, Narcissio Lopez and several of his major officers actually became members of this lodge in 1850. Uh, and they also went to travel into South, South Carolina as well, which was the parent Grand Lodge that would eventually create the Grand Lodge of Cuba. But it's interesting how this brother traveled uh, the South southern part of the United States from South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, all the way across into Texas, uh, looking for assistance, aid, and individuals that would help them join even in the fight together. So Narcissio Lopez was quite a individual, in the, uh, an incredible individual. But the unique thing about him is that he created the Masonic Cuban flag. And for years, I looked at the Cuban flag that my parents had, and I didn't think anything of it, even when I became a Mason. But when you turn the flag upright, it looks like a Masonic apron. And it was intended to show that way. The most eloquent testimony of Freemasonry's historical significance for Cuba is to be found in the loftiest symbol, the Cuban flag, where the Masonic ideal is concretely expressed in the red Masonic triangle placed over the three blue and two white bands, a symbol that sealed the intimate connection between Cuban independence and Freemasonry for eternity. Now, the interesting thing is that this didn't happen in Cuba, but it happened in Lower Manhattan. In June 1849, the Cuban national ensign, or our flag, was made in New York City in a rooming house on Warren Street between church and college place. Brother Lopez is quoted to have saying, let us take the equilateral triangle, for besides its Masonic significance, it is also a geometrical figure. The Cuban flag flew for the first time over the Sun magazine or newspaper building in Lower Manhattan, you see in the lower left-hand corner, that is the actual building, which is still there. And it flew for the first time on May 11, 1850, by Moses I. Beach, who was actually the publisher of The Sun. Eight days later, on May 19, 1850, it flew for the first time over Cuban soil when Brother Lopez carried it into the battle as a battle flag when he landed at Cardenas, Cuba. So interesting, not only did he come to Cuba to seek help and assistance and join Masonic lodges here, but he also came to New York City to create the Cuban flag, which was designed, sewn, and created here in New York City and then flown in Cuba several days later. Now, the Cuban flag has also inspired other flags. Now, the Chilean flag and the Texas flag kind of inspired the Cuban flag, all of which have Masonic overtones. But direct connections between the Puerto Rican flag, the Philippine flag, and the, the Catalonian separatists of Barcelona in Spain their flags were also inspired by not just the colors of the Cuban flag, but because of what it meant, what it stood for, and what they tried to achieve and eventually accomplished in Cuba. So several of these countries were actually affected. And also, these countries, in their own right, had revolutions themselves, each one led by a Freemason. And again, that was another reason why they, I think they kind of used the Cuban flag, because of what it meant to Masons around the world, that Cuban Masons had created this flag as a Masonic symbol for the nation to help them rid themselves of the oppression of Spain and slavery. Now this photo here is very unique because all of these individuals, which span maybe 60 years, uh, led many revolutions. All these individuals were Freemasons. So most of Cuba's Freemasons, most of its early presidents, uh, most of their famous revolutionary leaders, outside of Fidel Castro were all Freemasons. Uh, and they all played a unique hand in freeing the Cuban people, the Cuban country, and also creating its first constitution as well. And one of the earliest revolutions in Cuba, uh, Joaquin Infante created the, the Cuban constitution based off the American constitution. However, he didn't get to see it to fruition until 1895. But the constitution that Cuba created once it was liberated, after the Spanish-American War was the same constitution that was created probably about 70 years earlier when Joaquin Infante created that in that Masonic Lodge during that great Masonic conspiracy. Now, Cuba is very uh, unique. Cuba has a, a long history. It's a very dedicated Masonic country. Uh, lodges operate all year long with exception of two weeks, the annual anniversary of the revolution of 1895, which is held in May, and of course the Christmas period during December. 
Other than that, they meet every single week. However, some lodges break it down where they have a meeting a month for a particular purpose. One can be for degrees, one can be for business, one can be for programs, educational or instructive, and the other one could be for benevolence. Again, it's not the rule, but they are allowed to do that, and many of them do as well. Now, roughly today, there are about 320-something lodges in Cuba, uh, with roughly about 25,000 members. There are 16 provinces in Cuba, each with its own district deputy grand master, and most of the lodges in Cuba operate in the Scotch Rite, but there are several lodges that do operate in the York Rite. And last I spoke with the Grand Master, uh, they had about 116 lodges in Cuba. And again, these are the Grand Seals of the Grand Lodge of Cuba. Now, the interesting story comes to the modern age when Fidel Castro uh, is attempting a coup to overthrow uh, Fulgencio Batista. And in 1953, he tries to attack a garrison in the eastern part of Cuba. And he's quickly put down, he's quickly arrested, he's sentenced, he's actually sentenced to death, and he's, his death sentence is commuted, he's sent to prison, and then he's actually, after a year, he's actually exiled and he goes to uh, Mexico. Interestingly enough, he followed the same path that the father of the Cuban nation and people, Jose Marti, followed. Uh, he came, he was exiled, he tried to uh, establish a foothold of revolution in Cuba, he had to flee for his life. He went, to he went to Mexico as well. Then he came to the United States and spent 14 years in New York City, uh, gaining support and help and arms and money to raise again for the final revolution of 1895. But Castro seems to follow the same way. He actually, he escapes. Uh, they, they let him go. He exiles in Mexico. And there he spends several years reorganizing, reforming, trying to come back to Cuba for his second attempt at overthrowing the government of Fulgencio Batista. And that, of course, happens in 1959. If you see the movie Godfather, uh, I think it's Godfather 2, you know, you know the whole story of how uh, you know, they, they overthrow the government there. However, the interesting thing about uh, Castro's revolution is that Cuba was the only socialist communist country where Maestri was allowed to operate. I'm not going to say it was flourishing out in the open. It was kept quiet. It was kept underground. But for the most part, Castro did not bother the Masons. Now, Cuba is of a particular interest, again, because it's one of the few countries where communist and socialism was fully operating, and it still operated and was permitted to organize and meet. And the Grand Lodge of Cuba never skipped a beat. They didn't have any years of interruption. They didn't miss years without Grand Master. They always were able to operate, even during Castro's reign from 59 on to this day now. But the interesting story is, now there's many stories as to why this happened. The most popular story that goes is that when he did come back for his second attempt, landing in the eastern shores of Cuba in, in the early parts of 1958, again, he was chased. And he was running for the hills with his brother and several of his uh, operatives as well. And they realized at this time, if caught, they were gonna be killed. There was no going back to jail or being exiled. He literally ran for his life and it is rumored that a Masonic Lodge in the eastern shores of Cuba gave Castro Fidel and Raul and several of his compadres and comrades of arms safe haven and shelter at, by brethren Masons. Now, Castro himself and his brother were not Masons that we know of. We have no proof that they've ever been Masons. However, their families were known to have been members of the of Masonic fraternity, especially uh, you know, his, his elder family members of his immediate family. So he did have some sort of connection Masonic-wise, but he himself was never a Mason that we know of, has never been proven, nor his brother. But the interesting thing was that be, he, I guess he felt this kinship with the Masons and the fact that if it is a true story that they were the ones that saved him, it is one of the reasons why Cuba flourished and actually operated during his entire span of reign and to this day. So from 1959 forward to now 2023, Cuban masonry has not ceased to operate one day. They've had struggles. Uh, they've had financial problems, of course, because of the state of the, of the country and the embargo placed by the American, uh, by the United States uh, has prohibited them from even having enough regalia and aprons and stuff to wear at a lodge, although they are now fully wide open. They can they actually perform uh, ceremonies openly and publicly. They're no longer 
told to be kept on the ground. However, this was very unique because this movement actually is a movement that allowed Freemasonry to continue working even on the ground during some of the harshest conditions, but it was never penetrated or it was never, they never ceased to work or they were never, uh, they were never gone against their, their will. They actually were allowed to work. And again, there is speculation as to why. This is not a 100% true story. Uh, and I will give you my thoughts on why I believe at the end of this lecture as to how it actually, why I think Cuban Freemasonry actually allowed, was allowed to survive in Cuba. Uh, but because of this relationship with Fidel, again, he let them go. He didn't bother them. However, the secretaries of the lodge did have to produce minutes to the government office. And they had to send their minutes to a, a, the government office of Cuba, and there they would review it and, and read it. And there was always rumored that Fidel had members of his party become Masons and join these lodges to keep their eyes and ears open and see what they were doing. And of course, monitor what was actually sent in paper form written as to what actually happened there. Uh, again, a lot of this has never been really proven, but many of the Masons I've spoke to in Cuba tend to believe that they, over the years, especially in the early decades, they did have moles or brother Masons who were who joined and were members of the Communist Party just to be able to keep eyes and ears on what they were doing. And I'll get to a reason why uh, I'm sure they did that. Now, during Cuba's long-standing history of independence, Freemasons and Masonic lodges fulfilled three key functions allowing them to survive for over 200 years. Through countless wars, revolutions, imperial rule, and occupation. The first one, through their involvement in Masonic lodges, Cubans interested in autonomy or independence were able to meet, exchange, and enrich their ideas and create parallel organizations to implement them. Two, Spanish authorities recognized and feared such bonding and nurturing the catalytic effect. Three, many revolutionaries were themselves or had family or friends who were Masons. Thence, the new government was well aware of the institution's relevant and long involvement in Cuba's struggle for civic life. Now, in the Masonic Lodge today, which is very prevalent in many of the uh, Spanish lodges or the uh, South American Caribbean lodges, uh, in a Masonic Lodge in Cuba, the right of chain of union or force, represented by crossed hands and arms of the brethren, is symbolic of the evident unity of the power of Masonry. The Brotherhood is hoping to play an important role in the future of their country as we progress forward. Now, the other interesting part is why it's more evident why Castro really didn't go after him, because the Grand Lodge building of Cuba is a very beautiful historical building. And at one point, it was one of the tallest buildings in Havana. But when you walk inside, you see these murals on these walls. And all these murals are as they were when, they were, when this temple was first built uh, many, many decades ago, way before Castro. And all of the figures depicted in, this, in these murals that you can actually depict the face. Some of them are just a group of men with no faces. But most of the individuals, all the individuals you see here that have a discernible face were Freemasons and were at some point some sort of leader in some sort of uprising or revolution or trying to overthrow the Spanish government. And it's amazing that this building was not touched. Now, during the Cuban revolution of Fidel in 1959, uh, there was quite a lot of havoc and chaos. And as the years progressed, you had the Bay of Battle of the Bay of Pigs, uh, and then it was a total embargo uh, of the island of Cuba by the United States. And then it became total enemies, Cuba and the United States, because Cuba sided with Russia and became alliance with Russia, which uh, had repercussions on his own country there. But the interesting thing is that none of these murals or this building was touched. A lot of casinos and in what they call this capitalist imperialist uh, ownership of, of land and, and property and businesses was all seized by the government. However, any remnants of Masonic life was untouched. Now, if it was an American company, they, they destroyed it, they trashed it because they didn't want no association with a capitalist country. However, if you look through the National Masonic Museum here inside the building of the Grand Lodge of Cuba, uh, you will see busts of American patriots, Washington and Franklin, Abraham Lincoln. And it's very unique, as you see down the aisle here, there's the front entrance here. It's very unique that even when that hatred between Cuba and America grew, they didn't 
touch any sign of American leadership in this building here. This Grand Lodge has a lot of American artifacts, including the American flag, a lot of busts of American patriots, and at no time was it ever destroyed or touched. It was kind of off limits, which is very uh, rare considering the hatred that the two countries had amongst themselves and that uh, he would allow these American icons and figures and semblance of American uh, our country there in that Grand Lodge of Cuba. As you see here is the statue of Lincoln. Uh, these are just some of the pictures here in homage to Jose Marti, which is the father of the Cuban people and the Cuban nation, similar to George Washington here for America, for our people here. Uh, and you say nothing was touched. Everything was left alone. Nothing was destroyed. Nothing was touched. Of course, over the years and decades, the building has fallen into disrepair. The lack of funds, the lack of materials has really uh, strained the Masons and our brothers in Cuba, but they are making great strides to actually be able to rebuild the building, to restore it. The only downside was that all buildings or these type of buildings in Cuba, you had to give X amount of rooms to government offices. So when you go travel there today, it's 11 stories is building. Probably the first two floors are Masonic, the next five or six floors are governmental offices, and then the floors on top, uh, the top floors are the Masonic uh, Grand Lodge room, the museum and library. Uh, so you had to give space to the government offices. However, unlike we do here in America, if the government has an office here, they pay rent or they have uh, they, they actually support it or maintain the building in Cuba. That wasn't the case. So the government office got to, live, got to use those rooms for free. And unfortunately, they didn't do anything into the upkeep of the building. So it's been up to the Masons 100 percent to maintain it. And I was just uh, the bottom left hand figure there is the brother to the left pointing at me is Brother Victor. He's a good friend of mine, a 33rd degree Mason from uh, Cuba, and he is the caretaker of this museum and library. And he has, with along with many other Masons, uh, several months ago, went on a complete work on this building. They painted, they cleaned all the sculptures, they redid lighting in the building, trying to get it into the modern era, trying to get it a little bit more appeasing and maintaining the building. Again, it's a very great expense, ex money that they don't have, and materials is not often easy to come by there in Cuba. Again, this is just a building from the outside. It is world famously known because it does have a huge globe of the world on top of it. And on top of that sits the square and compass for all to see. Uh, and this was very iconic uh, during the years prior to Fidel Castro, when Cuba was a the hot spot of the world when it came to resorts and, and beaches and having a good time. Uh, the pictures to the left there, again, Victor and and, uh, and, uh, and the brothers, and also the individuals on top who work for the Grand Lodge office, the Grand Secretary, the Grand Treasurer, and many of the staff members that are painfully going through all these records and painfully trying to secure them, trying to restore them, trying to uh, make copies of it so that we can share in the wealth of knowledge of Cuban Freemasonry. Now, patriotism or conspiracy. The one thing which stands out in all of the history of Cuban Freemasonry is the persecution which the brethren have had to undergo as a result of their belief. Charges have been made that these brethren conspired against the government, but did not many American brethren also conspire against the English government in the early history of our own country? Do we condemn them for having so conspired? Washington, one of the chief conspirators, has become the father of our nation, honored and respected because he stood loyal to an ideal. Shall we condemn these early Cuban patriots for doing the same thing? In the span of 1868 to 1870, the number of lodges in Cuba was reduced from 30 to just seven. Many Freemasons were imprisoned and the Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Colón at that time, Jose Puente Badel, was shot along with many other brothers who were charged with the crime of Freemasonry. However, a common theme throughout this time period and the three wars of independence for Cuba is that Freemasonry led the fight against the Spanish crown. Now, brethren, my last kind of pitch talk here is one, why do I think Fidel let Masonry operate? Of course, we know the overall number one rumor is that the Mason Lodges gave him safe haven when he was running for the hills for his life, doing the, the second attempt at overthrowing the government of Cuba. But that may be so untrue, but I believe that Castro... Castro was a smart guy. 
he wasn't he wasn't a dumb guy. I mean, he, he was very well educated, came from a very wealthy family, and Castro knew how to manipulate people. He knew how to talk to the crowd. He knew how to talk to people. And he realized that in all the other communist countries and socialist countries around the world, they had a tendency to remove the history, remove the culture, and replace it with their own. Now, if you go to Russia during the time with Stalin, all of Russia's history was kind of wiped off, and everything you would see was either Lenin or Stalin. It'd be a statue or a painting or a monument. Even though Stalin was still alive, he honored himself. And we see this throughout many communist and socialist countries around the world. Again, Cuba being the only one that Masonry was allowed to operate. The other significant part is that I believe, the real reason I believe in my heart is that Castro, knowing the history, knowing his people, and knowing how other communist and socialist countries acted and how rebellion was always nipping at their heels, I would venture to say that he realized that reading the history of the Cuban people and the Cuban uh, past, especially during the colonial period, he realized the tenacity of the Cuban people to want to be free and independent and eradicate slavery. I've been able to demonstrate and show you here briefly how Cuba played a significant role and masonry played a significant role in many of the revolutions that were aimed to overthrow Spanish dominion and rule and to have freedom and democracy and eradicate slavery. At every step of the way, every time a dictator or a nation would come in and conquer, masonry always played a hand in trying to overthrow that. And I believe that Castro realizing this, saying every step of the way, every major event, every battle, these guys have always been here going after the people, attacking, going after the crown, going after a dictator. Castro, I believe, realized this and said, you know what? If I take the people's history away, if I take their leaders away, their founding fathers, their rich legacy, and if I come down on Masonry, Sooner or later, they're going to still meet. They may not meet in a lodge. They may meet in a basement. They may meet in a bar or a tavern or a restaurant. But these guys, for 150 years, have proven that the seeds of discontent were sown in Masonic gatherings or Masonic meeting places with Masons. And he realized, if I now come in here and strip them of Masonry, strip the people of their culture and their legacy, they're going to come after me, as they've done for the last 150 years. In my heart, I believe Castro was smart enough to say, you know what? I'm going to leave the people their heroes. I'm going to leave them their liberators. I'm going to leave them their founding fathers and their legacy. And I'm going to leave Freemasonry alone. They're not going to be out there in public. They're not going to be parading around town and with ceremonies and cornerstone and corn wine oil and all the other trappings of masonry. They're going to work on the ground. As long as they don't get in my way, I'm going to let them be. And for all of Castro's time, including after his death till now, Freemasonry has been allowed not to flourish 100% sometimes, but allowed to work and meet undisturbed all these years. And now Freemasonry is wide open again in Cuba. It is growing again. It is growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, it is getting worldwide recognition. Many jurisdictions outside of Cuba are now recognizing Cuba and Cuba recognizing them as well. But that is my take on why I believe Masonry was allowed to operate in Cuba unrestricted like that. Uh, because Castro realized that if there was going to be any problems or any type of revolution aimed at overthrowing him, chances are, because of the history, it was going to happen in a Masonic Lodge or within Masonic circles. So if I let these guys meet, I let them have their meetings, if I plant some of my guys in there just to keep an ear out, as soon as something comes up that could be a threat, I would be the first one to know. I would nip it in the butt and make sure I squall it and squash that so that it won't become a problem. When you oppress people, when you keep people down and take away their rights and their freedoms, there's always going to be a way for them to find a way to fight and gain those freedoms back. And Castro, I think, was smart enough to say, hey, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen with the Freemasons. Let them be. Let them work. Let them meet. Quietly, I'll keep an eye on them, but that's my take on I, what I believe is why Masonry was allowed to operate in Cuba. Now, the other reason why 
overall, Masonry is such a wonderful organization because Masonry is a perfect institution made up of imperfect men. All men err and all men make mistakes. Now, brethren, Masonry has a wonderful core values, has wonderful tenets, but I believe the greatest core value that we have is that for centuries, Masonry has allowed for men to meet, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of their creed, their culture, their faith, their language, their religion, or what country they came from. It allows men to come together, the rich, the poor, the noble, the elite, it doesn't matter. It allows us to come together, it allows us to agree with each other, it allows us to disagree, it allows us to debate, but at the end of the day, we come together never breaking that chain of union. And I think that's the greatest core value that our fraternity offers that nobody else offers around the world. This wonderful, unique opportunity for centuries meeting like this, where most religions, you're not allowed to meet, you're not allowed to have masonry. Many monarchical empires around the world forbid masonry to operate because one way of being able to dominate a people is by keeping them deaf, dumb, and blind, and also by stricking away their freedoms and their rights. And masonry has always had these freedoms in the lodge. We freely elect our officers, we freely pay our bills and do business in the lodge. But most importantly, we freely are able to discuss and engage each other. Free thinkers thinking a better way and a better future. And I think that's one of the greatest reasons why Freemasonry has always been a threat to many of these institutions because of how we meet and how we're able to discuss and how, most of all, how we're able to leave a lodge without having butchered one another. Masonry to me is very important, especially now in the times we're living here in this country and around the world. I think masonry need, the world needs a slice of masonry because of the actual things we're dealing with now. I think it's very important that we come together and realize that masonry offers something to the world that they can take a lesson from. That men can come together in the bonds of fellowship without butchering one another. And that's very unique. And many organizations and many religious backgrounds and dogmas, it's very unlikely that you'll be able to get men from all different walks of life to come together and be able to have this type of meeting, discuss, and yet leave in the end of the day without breaking that chain of union. Now, in closing, the master of lodge will close the lodge by giving the charge. And at the end of that charge, some jurisdictions are quite different, but for the most part, there's a part that goes, every human being deserves a claim upon your kind offices. Do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. Why would the master charge the brethren with his last breath, his last order, to go out and do what we do here and bring it to the world? Because I believe Freemasonry was not only started, created, but serves a purpose to where what happens in a lodge, how we conduct ourselves, how we treat each other, how we respect each other, how we tolerate each other, how we have diversity. I think those are the really core values that we have. And I think the master of the lodge wants us to take this and take it into the world. Don't close the, the altar, don't leave the lodge and leave the goodness that happens here. I think he wants us to take it to the world and show the world how Masons act and that the world can act the same way. We don't always have to like each other. We don't always have to agree with each other. But at the end of the day, we have to respect each other. And that's the ultimate goal and core value that we have in Masonry. And brethren, it's been an honor and pleasure to speak with you here today. I hope you enjoy it. May God bless you all. May God bless the United States of America. May God bless all our veterans, past and present, all our first responders and healthcare workers. Because it is by their sacrifice that we meet here today as free men and Freemasons. And most especially, may God continue to shine his blessings on the greatest fraternity in the world, Freemasonry. Thank you.